And so it talks there in chapter 25, verse 7, about it says all the, the sons instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning, meaning they, they were skilled in playing those instruments. And so there was an orderly uh, worship where they had 12 song leaders and they were up there for 15 days. And then the next 15 days, you'd have the next 12 song leaders. They were all skilled in what they were doing, and they all followed a prescribed order. There is always order with God, chaos and feelings and emotions. Nothing wrong with feelings and emotions, but going by them and being led by them is really chaos you, because you don't know what's going to happen. Whereas God is not the author of confusion. He's, he's a very orderly God, and he writes exactly how these songs should be done. Uh, in order to sing and learn God's word. And so that's what chapter 25 is all about. The point I wanted to make is not just about, you know, getting together and getting the emotions going and feeling the presence of the Lord and singing these songs that'll make you feel good. It's all about the reason God sets up these 288 people to lead the musicians is because it's all about just having God's word there that they can learn through an easier way to do it. In fact, that's what, you know, in the book of Colossians, Paul says, singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so that's really, if it's spiritual songs, you know, God is a spirit, his word is spirit. If it's spiritual in the right way, then it must be God's words. And so psalms, those are God's words. And so really, Songs that you sing should just be nothing but God's word set to music so that as you're going through your day, you're thinking about those things and you're thinking about God's word so that God's word is always in you. And that's another form of First Thessalonians 5.17, praying without ceasing. Because you're praying, you're talking to God through, through the very words of God that you've learned through song. So chapter 25, verses 8 through 31, go over those 24 courses of musicians I mentioned. Chapter 26 goes over the employees of the house of the Lord. You know, it's a pretty big house. Uh, um, Got to have a lot of employees there. I wanted to key on verse 8. It takes of 1 Chronicles, verse 8. It says, All these of the sons of Obed-Edom, they and their sons and their brethren, able men for strength for the service, were three score and two of Obed-Edom, or in other words, 62 sons. Uh, verse 9, And Meshelamiah had sons and brethren, strong men, 18. Also Hosha of the children of Merari had sons, Simri the chief, for though he was not the firstborn, yet his father made him the chief. Hilkiah the second, Tebaliah the third, Zechariah the fourth, all the sons and brethren of Hosha were 13. So you have Obed-Edom had 62, 62 sons. Um, could have had some daughters too, probably did doesn't tell you how many daughters, but he had at least 62 sons. The next one, Meshelamiah, had 18 sons. Hosa had 13 sons. So you think, Obed-Edom, why did he have so many sons? You know, 62 sons. Um, you know, yeah, daughters, or 100 kids. So, you know, what the deal, what's the deal? Well, if you hold your place there, go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Obed-Edom was mentioned before. And when David brought the ark of the Lord, it was when David was bringing the ark of the Lord up to Jerusalem. Uzzah, if you remember, was took touched the ark and died, and because of that David was afraid, and he had the ark of the Lord dwell in Obed Edom's house. Look down at verse ten, Second Samuel chapter six, verse ten. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So the Lord blessed Obed-Edom. You can go back to First Chronicles now, chapter 26. I think the reason we're told this here in verse 8, he's mentioned how God blessed him. God blessed him with a very fruitful bosom. He ended up having 62 sons, probably over 100 kids, whereas somebody like Mishalamiah had only 18, and Hosea had 11. Obed-Edom had an abundance of children, and that appears to be God's blessing, God's fulfillment, or the specifics of God's blessing of Obed-Edom that was mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11. Then as you go down to uh, verse 13 through 18, you have the gates, 
that uh, of the of the house of the Lord there around the temple there, and of course one of my favorite verses, and I can't skip over this, is that if you want to really get a, a very blank, confused look of, from someone, if they ask you, you know, what's what's your life verse, verse, brother? You know what what verse are you trying to follow in your life? What you do is you quickly quote First Chronicles twenty six eighteen, and they say, at Parbar westward four at the causeway and two at Parbar. And then they think, what in the world are you talking? Is this guy speaking in tongues? And uh, so there, there you go. You can use that um, however you wish. But really, Parbar is just a, it's just a gate, uh, one, one of the gates there toward the temple area. And they had at the, you had the Levites there. Uh, four stood at the causeway uh, there around that gate, and then two at the very gate of Parbar. Uh, that's what that verse means. But it sounds really cool if you say. Yeah, First Chronicles twenty six eighteen at Parbar Westward, four at the Causeway, and two at Parbar. You know, sounds like very important there. Like you know what you're talking about. Then we go to chapter twenty seven. Chapter twenty seven uh, talks about those in service of the king. Uh, verses one through three. You really see how elaborate uh, his kingdom is, his house, everything involved. You know, the house of the Lord, everything. Um, there are twelve courses that served David. There in verses one through three. Each course contained 24,000 people. And then verses 2 through 15 give you the names of those courses there. Uh, verses 16 through 22 takes over the tribes of Israel. Um, that's interesting. There's a, If you look there in chapter 27, we'll just read a couple of verses here. Uh, verse 16. Furthermore, over the tribes of Israel, the ruler of the Reubenites was Eleazar, the son of Zechariah, of the Simeonites, Shephathiah, the son of Makkah. So you have one ruler over each tribe. If you hold your place there, you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Uh, what God set up there in First Chronicles, chapter 27, under David, you're going to see happen again in the eternal kingdom. Except it won't be, you know, uh, it was Eleazar over the Reubenites, or Shephathiah over the Simeonites, and all these people here. Rather, it will be the twelve apostles, each one of them a ruler over a tribe. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, said unto the Lord, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Each apostle is going to have his own throne. Each one will be over a separate tribe of Israel. So you can let go of Matthew 19 there. But if you want to know sort of how that's going to work, you can read the details over here in First Chronicles 27. Remember, the reason that First Chronicles is written is to give you an idea of what that eternal kingdom is going to be like under the rulership of David. So you might think, oh, this is kind of boring reading all these names and everything. And, you know, I'd rather read Second Samuel because then I'd get all the dirt on David and I could read all the cool s stuff that he did and how he fled and uh, committed adultery and murder and all this stuff and get to find out everything he did. And First Chronicles leaves all that detail out, and it just gives me a bunch of names. You know, it's kind of boring. I've already read the stuff that's interesting already, so why even read it? Well, the reason is because this gives you a glimpse into that eternal kingdom, and those names are mentioned. That's exactly how it's going to be set up in that eternal kingdom. He's going to, the Lord is going to be in charge, just like He was there through David. So He's going to have those twenty-four courses of musicians and twenty-four courses of priests, and He's going to have. You know all this stuff. Is he's, so he's going to have those twelve rulers, and you're told that they are the twelve apostles. And so you can look at that. You could say you could replace the name. I, now I don't know who's going to be over Reuben, who's going to be over Simeon. We're not told that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if each apostle came from a different tribe, and and they will just rule over the tribe they came from. I I don't know. I haven't researched that. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's not just a bunch of names here in First Chronicles. Rather, it's showing you how the kingdom was set up under David and how it will be set up in that eternal kingdom. So when you see these 12 rulers, you know, well, the 12 apostles, they're going to be those rulers in that eternal kingdom. So it will be a little more interesting, I think, if you read it that way. And if you go down to verse 23 there, First Chronicles 
chapter 23. Remember, David numbered the people, and God had said, you know, he sinned by doing that because the people were not supposed to be numbered. They were supposed to be as the sand of the sea. You can't count them for multitude. They were supposed to be the stars of the heaven. You can't count them for multitude. And David went ahead and counted them. As a result, thousands of people died in Israel uh, because of his sin. And when that happened, you notice that uh, David stopped the numbering. Look there in First Chronicles chapter 27, verse 23. It says, But David took not the number of them from 20 years old and under, because the Lord had said he would increase Israel like to the stars of the heavens. Joab the son of Zeruiah began number, but he finished not, because there fell wrath for it against Israel. Neither was the number put in the account of the Chronicles of King David. So it tells you there that because of that plague that God sent against Israel, David never finished the numbering, and it tells you why the Lord sent that plague. It's because he said he would increase Israel like to the stars of the heavens. They couldn't be counted. So that's just a little brief note that's in there. It gives a little, little detail of when you read those numbering, you didn't get that, but now you, uh, you can sort of plug that back into that story there to give you a little more detail of uh, you know what happened. Chapter 28, then, of First Chronicles, David gives the pattern of the house of the Lord to Solomon for him to build. Remember, David is doing all the preparation he can possibly do for the house of the Lord. You're not given all that detail back in Second uh, Samuel and First Kings uh, because this is more related to that uh, eternal kingdom, and you know God's going to be ruling from the house of the Lord, so those details are important to him in that kingdom. So in chapter 28, David giving the pattern of the house of the Lord to Solomon. Uh, notice in verse 2, uh, you may remember, in fact, well, we we'll go ahead and read chapter 28, verse 2. It said, Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of God and had made ready for the building. So the Lord God will put his name there at the temple when it's built. He will dwell there, but it's not. And Solomon will mention, and we'll see it later, when he builds the house, the Lord is so big, he can't be contained in a building, no matter how big it is. You know, he's, he's everywhere. And so it's not really a place for him to dwell as far as, you know, sitting in a chair, uh, because he's just, he's just too big for a building. And so really you're told to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. That's really the first reason is so the Ark could have a place to rest there. And um, that was in the Ark was the Covenant. It had the Ten Commandments in there. And the Lord would come and uh, in the midst of the two cherubim that hovered their wings were over there protecting there the Ark. And the Lord would come on that mercy seat and give mercy to the nation of Israel. And so... Uh, God, uh, David wanted a safe place for that to be. So that's the first reason that built, had, the, had Solomon build the house of the Lord. And then the second reason it says, for the footstool of our God. Uh, God couldn't dwell in there, but it could be a footstool for him. Hold your place there and go over to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, where you're told a little more detail about that. When it's talking about the, the house of the Lord that was built, uh, Isaiah chapter 66 verse 1 incidentally Isaiah 66 is talking about that eternal kingdom to come uh, and what's going to be what's going to happen in that in that reign that's still future and he says there in Isaiah 66 verse 1 it says thus saith the Lord the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest meaning no house can contain the Lord he will still dwell there um, the Lord Jesus Christ having a, being the image of God he became flesh and dwelt among us as John 1 verse 14 tells us since he became flesh he has a body and so his body can be there but as far as the spirit and where God is as a whole um, it says the heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool showing how big God is well then you go back to First Chronicles 27 I'm sorry 28 verse 2 that's exactly what David had in mind it's for the footstool of our God. The earth is his footstool. His house would be part of that footstool for God. Okay, and then we go um, basically chapter 28. Chapter 28 uh, through chapter 29 verse 5 are David's last words to Israel. Solomon and Israel there. Uh, Moses 
Joshua and Samuel all had said to they had said they gave sort of a final address a farewell address to Israel and remember they had the covenant under Moses they had that old covenant where they were to in order to be God's people to be the kingdom of priests to reconcile the world back to God they had to or they had to serve the Lord obey his commandments and each subsequent leader of Israel tells Israel to obey God's commandments in his final address. Moses in his final address says it in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 16. Moses is there in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 16. Joshua tells Israel to obey God's commandments. That's found in Joshua chapter 24 verses 23 through 25. Joshua 24 verses 23 through 25. Samuel in his last words to Israel tells them to obey the Lord's commandments found in 1 Samuel chapter 12 verses 14 and 15 1 Samuel chapter 12 verses 14 and 15 and now David does the same thing in chapter 28 verse 8 look there in chapter 28 verse 8 now therefore in the sight of all Israel the congregation of the Lord and in the audience of our God keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God that ye may possess this good land and leave the inheritance for your children after you Forever, It was a conditional covenant. Unlike today, we receive heaven because of the atonement of Jesus' blood, shed blood on the cross for our sins, and then we receive that atonement already, and then we have eternal life. Whereas in that day, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, it was salvation was conditional upon obeying the law. And so each subsequent leader of Israel gives that instruction, and that's what David does in his final address there, 28 verse 8 he says keep the commandments of the Lord your God so that you may possess this good land if not you're going to be kicked out of the land conditional covenant and in fact verse 9 tells you that it's a conditional covenant it says and thou Solomon my son know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts if thou seek him he will be found of thee. See, it's conditional. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. That goes in line with that covenant that that David, that God gave to Solomon, that he would establish his kingdom, the throne of his kingdom forever. But he had to obey God's commandments. David is reminding him that, and it applies to all Israel as well. It's that if they seek the Lord, if they obey His commandments. They will possess the promised land. They will be God's people. They will never be moved from that. But if they forsake him, God will cast them off. So now, um, verses 11 through 21, basically, you have David doing everything he could possibly do, last-minute stuff for the house of the Lord, except actually building it. And then, notice in verse 19, the house of the Lord isn't just something that David had in his mind that he wanted to build a house for the Lord. Uh, but it wasn't just his vision, something that he thought up and saying, oh, let's put a chair over here, let's put an altar here, let's put the Ark of the Covenant over there, right over here. It, it was specifically given by God. Chapter 28, verse 19 tells you that. It says, all this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. And so God is the one who came up with the pattern of the house of the Lord and everything that David did in preparing for. He wanted to make sure that pattern was followed so he did everything he possibly could so that Solomon could just take over from there and he could build the house of the Lord, specifically design it as God had told it to, to, to design it. And it's because, and so knowing that, you know that the Lord then this had the house of the Lord built not unlike what it would be in that new Jerusalem. Uh, New Jerusalem is going to come down on earth and that's where the house of the Lord is going to be in that new Jerusalem there. Uh, it's going to be not unlike the house of the Lord that David built. So if you read these details and think, oh, it's kind of boring, I don't want to read this. Remember, think of it in mind. In the Adam, this is what the house of the Lord is going to be. So if you look like, so if you want to know where the Lord's going to be on earth forever and what his house is going to look like, you just read this here. Uh, the pattern here in the building of the house of the Lord and get a pretty good idea. Um, also notice another point here. It says, All this said David the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me. 
And that tells you more about the inspiration of the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Well, how did he do that? Some people, in an effort to uh, bring p potential error into God's Word, they say, well, you know, sure, God inspired all His words, but he just gave the concepts. He just gave the ideas, and then they, uh, the men just sort of took it and went with it. So you got some basic ideas, some basic outlines, some basic information about God, but there could be some things that are wrong, some things that aren't, aren't as accurate as other things because man was involved. But that is an inaccurate statement. This verse here exactly how God's Word was put together. It wasn't just the Lord giving concepts, but the Lord gave man. In this case, it says, made me understand in writing, by his hand upon me. The Lord gave the very words to the writers of Scripture, and those writers wrote them down exactly word for word verbatim as God told them. And the Lord, actually, his hand was upon that writer's hand and making sure it was written exactly as God wanted it written. Because the Lord is holy, he could not deal with anything that is unholy. He would be defiled. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that the Word was God. This Word, this book, is God, just as much, you know, it's it's God's written Word. And so, since it is God, it must be holy as well. And so, God couldn't have any errors, any mistakes whatsoever. And so, he made sure that when David wrote it down, it was his very words. It wasn't just ideas or concept, but every single word is from the Lord. And therefore, we can trust it all, and knowing that it's with us it is from the Lord okay so uh, we had that specific pattern uh, you can hold your place there also go to Exodus chapter 25 uh, because God did a similar thing with Moses if you remember he had after he got off the mountain actually when he was on the Mount Sinai getting the instructions from the Lord it wasn't just the Ten Commandments he received he was up there 40 days and 40 nights and I know God may take his times at times but uh, he's not that slow of a writer where he'd take him 40 days to write down Ten Commandments rather he wrote he gave the entire law up there and Moses uh, brought that down well he also gave the pattern and there are several chapters in Exodus that tell you the pattern for the tabernacle that he built that temporary tent that the Lord would dwell in while they were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years and uh, Exodus chapter 25 verse 9 tells you uh, the Lord said unto Moses says according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even even see make it so God was very specific and make it because again it's a holy place where God would dwell it had to be perfect and so he gave a pattern specifically to Moses exactly how he would write it build it similarly he did the same thing with David back in first Chronicles chapter 28 so then we go to chapter 29 uh, just a couple points I wanted to mention uh, if you look at verse 20 you have this is part of David's prayer and then in chapter 29 verse 20 it says, uh, David finished the prayer, and it says, And David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God, and all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers, and bowed down their heads, and worshipped the Lord and the King. I just wanted to make a point here. Today, usually when people say a prayer, they bow their heads in reverence to the Lord. And you might go, where does that come from? I'm not sure. Actually, Jesus, when he prayed, he broke bread and blessed it. Uh, before he fed the multitudes, he stood and looked toward heaven. Uh, the opposite from bowing the head and closing your eyes, but in reverence. But uh, if there is a biblical basis for bowing your head in prayer, this could be it here. First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine, verse twenty. Now, if you're ever wondering if that was mentioned in the Bible, yes, it is, and there it is. The so verse twenty-three: Solomon becomes king. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. So Solomon is king, and then David dies. In verse 28, he died in a good old age, full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon his son reigned in his stead. And that's how the book of 1 Chronicles ends. It's all about King David. Once King David dies, you have Solomon, and that's where 2 Chronicles starts. So we'll start there in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 now. Probably all for the story, but in verse 7, Solomon asks for wisdom. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7, And that night did God appear unto Solomon, and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon 
sent unto a great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. There is the Abrahamic promise. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God ends up granting him wisdom. There, there in verse 12, not only did he give him wisdom, he gave him other things. He gave him wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. And I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there any after thee have the like. Notice there are five things mentioned there. Wisdom, God gives wisdom, knowledge, uh, riches, wealth, and honor. He only asks for one, God gives five. Five being the number of divine grace and so in the Bible. And so God's grace is upon Solomon here, giving him more than he asked for and more than he deserves, certainly. Um, didn't deserve any of it, but God gives him wisdom, knowledge, riches, wealth, and honor with that in God's grace. Also notice in verse 15, I mentioned that David had all that gold, you know, 100, 100 some million pounds of silver and 13.1 million pounds of gold in abundance. Well, that's pretty common. And in fact, that tells you there in, in verse 15, it says, And the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. So, you know, you just walk down the street or walk down, you know, in a, in a, non-developed area and you'll see all kinds of stones um, that's how plenty of silver and gold is just like a common stone it's interesting that when first kings chapter 10 verse 27 mentions this it only mentions the silver here it mentions the gold to gold being a sign of the kingdom of the king and so this being books about kings um, you know the chronicles of the eternal kingdom the kings there